I've, I've seen with my running and my cycling, but I'm just a lot stronger for a longer duration. Yeah, yeah. Whereas previously, I don't know, regardless of how fit my lungs were, there was always a time where I was just cramping and my legs. But also I think I was, I'm always under eating. Bro, fueling is so yeah. important. You know, everyone's always like, oh, eating is cheating and like, you know, be a man and, you know, you got to do a fasted ride to get skinny or whatever, but there's a time and a place for it. You got yeah. to <laughs> graze. And I think, okay, well, obviously the amount of hours and Ks you're riding, it's a lot easier to be leaner in terms of, I mean, how many calories are you burning a day? I'm fat and unfit now, bro, but like in season, you're doing 6,000 calories okay. on the bike. Yeah. yeah. So you say you're fat and unfit. Yeah. You just obviously, and first, but actually before I get that, so you are, I would say, the most decorated guest <laughs> to this day that I've had on. You know, I've had amazing sportsmen. I would say like Kevin Lorena is maybe like the second sure. most oh. titled. And he's an amazing athlete yeah, and everything. But, <laughs> you know, you're a two-time Olympian. Yeah. you South Africa, two-time South African champ. Yeah, road and time trial. And continental champ. What yeah. is that? Yeah. Yes. African champ, yeah. And you just won the 94. Yeah. So that's actually where I was leading with it was, you say you fat and unfit, but were you fat and unfit and then still won the 94? You can be, you can be honest. <laughs> I think it's all relative, you know, I think, you know, obviously for the local guys, you know, 947 is a big deal. Coming from Joburg, I remember when I was at school, you know, like that's the, the highlight of the year is is the 947, the yeah. ride Joburg. But I think you just, racing abroad, you've got a different pedigree, a lot of experience, uh, you know how to suffer. So even when I'm fat and unfit, you know, to go hard for two hours isn't the end of the world. Yeah. Um. So yeah, like privileged to, to, to race and it's always nice to support the local guys but but also nice to get the get the win and the, the paycheck at the end of the yeah, day yeah i was always wondering because obviously you coming from having done tour de france as a full-time 100 percent career cyclist i didn't know if you'd be allowed to then just enter 94 if there's like certain regulations so so because it's, it's not considered a professional race so like the governing body of cycling you know they they host professional races this is like what's called like a grand fondo so it's like a, a fun race because you know anyone can enter mm. it you can be 75 years old and do it on a mountain bike and ride at 20 k's an hour you know so that's the, the beauty of it but it's not really considered a professional race so my team's biggest thing was don't crash you know i had to get permission from them um make sure your insurances are in place you know in case there's an issue but just have fun um, so, but the, the organizers generally try and get me there just, you know, for, for Chias. But yeah, I'm and so it's good promotion for the race, obviously, 100%. to have someone of your stature doing it with the other guys. Exactly. I mean, uh, this is the first year I kind of, I wouldn't say took it seriously, seriously, but in previous years, you know, it's, it's on a Sunday, Sunday's after a Saturday, it's my off season, so you got to go out <laughs> on the Saturday. Also, the Boko were playing, you know, so you've got to, you got to have, have a good time for the boys. Um, but this year I kind of probably got like four hours of sleep before the race. So it's more than I've got in the past. <laughs> so I was well, well prepped. I think that just is testament to you as a cyclist <laughs> to be able to probably have gone out the night before, had a few drinks and then to still come and win the 94. It was, well, at least from the video I saw, cause obviously I was still busy riding when you were already finished, but it looked like it was a sprint finish there. Yeah, it was. So touch and go. I mean, it's it's normally like a race like this. I think the last few years has been like three guys kind of going for the for the win together. This year there was a group of maybe twenty five of us going to the line. Um, so you, anything can happen. I think a lot of my experience came into play. Like I knew where to take that lo lo last corner, that last left hander. Um, so it was close, but but a win's a win. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> so okay, so fat and unfit, sure, but um, obviously relatively. But, so if you were at your, you know, when you were now for the Olympics or at Tour de France, mm. what then, what time would you have shaved off there? What, what would you say if you were at your fittest, you would have been able to do? You know, a big thing is also, you know, obviously the main objective is at, at, at racing in the elite is to win the race. So it's, you're kind of not really too worried about the time. Um, there's parts in the race where we go quite fast. There's parts in the race where it's quite slow and negative, you know, where everyone's looking around. Um, I think if like I was on top, top form, um, I probably would have maybe gone away in Kyle Army or, or maybe kind of through Douglas Dale. I, I reckon sub two is possible. Um, you know, you've got to have the wind in your favor and things like that, but I reckon we could shave off 10 minutes. Um, but yeah, I did like the, the only other time I've raced in South Africa is at the national championships, which was when I'm also quite strong and fit and I'm focused mm. and you know, you can win by minutes. Um, so I'd like to think, believe, maybe I'm wrong, you know, maybe, maybe it wouldn't be the case, but if I was, 
in prime condition, I think, you know, to win by a couple of minutes and aim for that sub two. And how different is it? Because obviously, let's say Tour de France, you there within the team, you've got a specific role. There's certain times where you must push, you must help, and all of these things. How different is that type of riding for like stage racing at a Tour de France compared to just a one day almost just make sure you're in the front and make sure that you're able to give the gas and win when you need to? It's such a different mindset. You know, you're doing a Tour de France and, and firstly you're racing for like five, six hours. And it's day after day after day. Um, as you mentioned, you've got a role within the team, you know, so your role today might be, look, we're finishing up a mountain, Ryan, that's not going to suit you. So we need you in the early parts of the race to ride in the front, go fetch bottles. If you you know, your captain stops for a wee, you've got to stop and look after him, kind of stuff like that. Um, you've got, I wouldn't say time, but like people watch the Twitter France and a lot of it's like, it's quite boring. I mean, I can't watch cycling. I think it's so boring. But I mean, as a cyclist, you most people don't, what they specialize in, don't really entertain themselves. Entertain them. Yeah. But there's also some truth in that. You know, when you're doing a five, six hour day, seven hours sometimes, it's impossible to go flat out all the time. Where in these local races, I mean, I'm racing alone. It's two hours, two and a half hours at most. It's kind of just, you know, you can't really afford to make a mistake. There's no time to really relax. Um, but it is just so different. You know, you don't really have to have breakfast or you don't really have to fuel yourself properly. Mm. Where you're on those tours and that, it's all about nutrition and it's all about just suffering for hours and hours on end day after day and how has that mind shift been for you because obviously you've been cycling your whole life i mean we did some old races like mintech millions of years ago in ramberg I, actually i drove past the other day and it actually reminded me of it and how has your mind shift had to grow and improve obviously doing local races which are shorter than to you know almost riding for a full month it is a mindset shift more than anything you know i think people always think, oh, wow, it's so hard to ride a bike for six hours day after day. But anybody can do that. Anybody can climb on a bike and ride six hours. You know, it's all relative based on how fast you go or how hard you push, but anyone can do that. The difference is, is that, you know, it's your job, it's your profession, you're at the highest level. There's a lot of sacrifice, there's a lot of suffering. I think my biggest thing is I've learned how to suffer. Um, I've also learned with adversity, with disappointment, you know, you, you're going to crash, you're going to get sick, you you lose a lot more than you win. Mm. Um, you've just got to kind of be resilient. And it's it's all in the mind. You know, you're going to have periods where you just, you're hating it, but you're doing it for a purpose. You know, it's different when it's your job versus your hobby, but the mind has just got to understand, listen, it's going to suck for 95% of the time, but you know, there is a goal or there is a something at the end mm. and you've got to kind of motivate yourself and just know that you're doing this for a reason. Has there been, because I know, when you're doing something recreationally, that's when it's more fun, less serious. How have you had to adapt to, okay, well now this is my career. This is, you know, it's going to become less fun when, like, as you mentioned before 94, you had to get permission. You had to make sure that you were safe so you don't get injured. All of these things make it less recreational and less fun to a degree. 100%. You know, how has that been? It, it's hard. I think, you know, you're passionate when you're young about something. And I think anyone in any industry, you know, whether it be professional sports or not, they're very excited to be an accountant or they're very excited to do this. And it gets monotonous eventually. And you go through phases where this isn't fun, but ultimately it is my career, it is my job. You know, I'm not having to go to an office for eight hours a day, but some days it's raining outside and I've got to go do seven hours. And that's just what you've got to do. So I think you've got to remember why you're doing it. Um, you've got to find a bit of enjoyment and you've got to be passionate about it. Otherwise, I think it's pointless, regardless of what you do in life. But it is that kind of, you've got to make it fun when you can. So I'll go for a training ride, but you know, some days where there's less structure, if I don't have a specific program, it's go do five hours, go ride with your mates, you know, go and stop and have a coffee, go and do an event like the Ride Joburg 947, because there's a lot of stress around it, but it's more fun than anything else, you know? And I think you've got to find that where you can. So it's still within cycling, it's still within racing, but you look for 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 the fun aspects of it and, and having good mates around and, and things like that really help. Mm. And that's what's nice about endurance sports in general. It's very community based 100%. and it's very special to have to go through suffering for six hours and know, okay, the guy next to me is also going through the exact same thing. He also needed to, unlike you, get more than four hours of sleep before night was, before right Joburg. So it's all of these things where, okay, this guy has gone through, he's endured, he's suffered with me. And I'm sure, obviously, I mean, doing something like, um, you know, represent, representing the country at Olympics, doing um, obviously the massive team events of um, the likes of Tour de France. It's a massive community and 
you surrounded by so many people that are pushing as much as you are. They are sometimes better than you. They push you to be better. And I think to be at the top level, you need to surround yourself with those kind of people, those kind of riders and those kind of athletes. 100%. It's, it's, as you say, you've got that, that mutual respect almost for each other because you've all sacrificed so much. You're sacrificing time away from family. You're sacrificing, you know, you're risking your life on a daily basis when you go training, you know, in races every year, there's a crash where someone dies. So you, you Everyone's aware of the risk, but you're all in it together. And yes, you you hate the guy next to you and you're racing him and you want to beat him. But at the end of the day, you know that he's put in just as much work that you have. And that does kind of, you have that, that respect and that, that appreciation, but it also does encourage you. And as you say as well, to have people around you who are constantly pushing you, you know, if I just stayed in South Africa, you know, not to sound brash or a little bit arrogant, but I think I could pretty much win 90% of the races, but then, you know, where's the, where's the drive in that? You've got to be training with people who are better than you, racing with people who are better than you to encourage you to take a step up. Otherwise you're going to get complacent. You're going to get stagnant. And you know, what's the point in that? You've got mm -hmm. to always be striving to be better and having that, those people around you. It's all about the people you surround yourself yeah. with. Well, I mean, your wife and we're very fortunate to be talking to you because she's literally, if not today, hundred percent giving birth tomorrow which is the 4th of December. That's when well, we're recording this on the 3rd. But how has that, the knowing that you're going to be a father now, changed your mindset within your career? Or have you not tried to even think about that? Because there's obviously so much other stuff to think about. Very good question. Um, firstly, I think having a partner like I have, you know, she's she's had to sacrifice so much for me already. So since we've been together, it's always been about my career. She's had to move. She left her job in South Africa, moved away from friends and family, created a new life with me. So she's already sacrificed so much. So now, not to say that it's, you know, her turn or it's her child, it's our child, but it's kind of now, you know, this is our next step. And, you know, if I have a bad day on the bike or a bad race, it does affect her, you know, indirectly, but it, it's not the end of the world. We're having a child, you know, this, this affects us both so, so much. So I think I've got a bit more of a respect for her and and having a child I think will motivate me and drive me. I'm not just doing this for myself. I'm not doing this for my own accolades or for a paycheck. I'm doing this because I'm trying to create a life. I'm trying to provide. I'm trying to leave a legacy. So again, it's not here yet, but just from what I've spoken to other cycling fathers and, and people who, who just have, have children in general, they say it does change your mindset and, you know, your priorities change and, and everything just kind of, you stop worrying about the small things. Um, I hope that's the case. I hope that kind of tomorrow I have like a epiphany and, and life is, is more clear. Um, but I, I think it will be. And I really think just this process and knowing what's to come has definitely, you know, helped me grow and mature and kind of, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing. So make it count. Don't just stuff around, you know, mm. and hopefully can lead to, to a better life. And obviously you're going to be born in South Africa. Was that by design or was it more just because of the family would be around? I've seen a lot of, um, South Africans, professional athletes abroad, um, have children that side and it's, it's difficult, you know, it's, it's different cultures. It's, it's, you don't have that support structure. We found that, you know, we, we, we're quite close with our family. We don't get to see them that often. So we thought it'd be important to be around people who love us, people that can help. I've also still got to, you know, leave in a month's time and go back to Europe. So we thought, you know, have a child here where you can communicate with the, with the doctors and the staff. It's two minutes from home, family's five minutes away. Um, it just kind of, it will just make her life a lot easier. And also me going back overseas, knowing that, you know, I'm suffering and I've got to do what I'm doing, but I'm not worried about what's going on at home. You know, at least I know that, okay, the wife's okay. The baby's okay. There's people around. So it was, mm -hmm. it was planned this way. Um, and I think it's definitely for the best. Yeah. You mentioned obviously making sacrifices, obviously maybe more sacrifices will have to be implemented than when the child is born. But what for you has been the most difficult sacrifices and challenges as a professional cyclist that you've had to endure? Has it been just generally time away from loved ones or? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, I started this as, as quite a, quite a youngster, you know, I was always, as you know, we used to race together 12 years old kind of thing. And I, I always, I took it seriously kind of from high school. So, you know, I still had my fun and I still c can do things here and there, but I kind of missed my young adulthood. Um, I missed that whole university lifestyle or, or, you know, the joining phase. I still did it where I could and maybe trying to make up for lost, lost time in the off season, but you, you miss fundamental things. You, you miss like birthdays and funerals and weddings. You, you miss the family holidays, you know, this time of year, it's getting to the festive time. People go away 
you know, I, I wouldn't be able to go away. And if I do, I'd have to take my bike. And then everyone's doing a Christmas lunch, but okay, sorry, Ryan, we'll keep the food warm for you because you've got to go and do six hours. That that's it's it's hard. And you know, it's when you're in it and you're overseas, you feel the sacrifices, but it's not in your face. But almost when you're at home, you, you feel it more, you know, because you you're there, but I can't go to this or I, I can't commit to this. And that's that's quite tough. I mean, it sounds not that bad, and and I suppose all sacrifices are relative to you, but it, it, it does kind of accumulate. And, you know, when you're missing your best mate's wedding and then you're missing the this and you're missing that and you think to yourself, you know, shucks, is it worth it mm -hmm. just for a, another training rider? But you've got to make sacrifices. You've got to do what you've got to do. And it does pay off. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people overlook, you know, they say, oh, well, what, Ryan cycling? I have to sit in the office. You look, Ryan's cycling down the Champs-Élysées. I'm stuck in traffic in Santa. Like they look at those kind of things and they'll be like, oh, the sacrifices he's making aren't that bad. But then ask someone, okay, well, come, we're going for a 10K run on a Saturday. They're like, yeah, I don't know if I can do that. Whereas if you can't even do that, then how are you going to do the six hour rides? How are you going to do all these things? So I think there's a massive cost to be paid for excellence. And I mean, everyone knows this and that's why 99% of the world isn't excellent. It's because there's such a massive cost actually to be paid to achieve anything great. And people overlook that because, you know, they want to believe that, oh no, if I wanted to be like Ryan, I could be. Whereas, no, you can't. You can't. 100%. So often people say, oh, had I taken up cycling at a younger age, or if I didn't have a full-time job and I had the time to do 30 hours of training a week, you know, I could be there. Well, firstly, try it then, you know, t t you know, if you back yourself, take a sabbatical or, or quit your job because you're going to chase the stream, do it. And then, oh no, you know, and, and why not? Because you're scared or like you say, I mean, I am privileged and I'm in a blessed position and yes, I do have the time to train and this is my, my life. Um, a lot of people who are probably more talented than me didn't have the opportunities I had or didn't follow it. But as you say, there is so much, it sounds amazing and everyone always thinks the grass is greener and I could do that, do it then. Mm -hmm. and, and, then and then we can chat. Yeah, I think the biggest thing for people is priorities. If you say to someone, you're the most important person in my life, I'm sorry, I need to go and do this. Well, then maybe they're not the most important person in your life. You know, um, sorry, I really want to come cycle with you guys on a Saturday, but, but instead yeah. I'm going to go to my kid's birthday party. Okay, well then the kid is the most important thing and that's what you chose. So there's opportunity cost and what you choose is what you choose. And at the end of the day, that's going to lead you in the direction that you're going. 100%. So at what point, because obviously you mentioned starting young, at what point did you realize like, oh, okay, this actually needs to become a, well, should become a career or can become a career? I, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I'd always convinced myself kind of in, in late high school, I stopped playing school sports, you know, because I was focusing on the cycling and I, I was doing well locally. Um, and then I almost had an identity crisis two years after school where I did chase the dream for a little bit and, and I kind of was not bad as a, as a under 20 year old in Europe, but I wasn't making any money. And, and I kind of had like a, that moment where, you know, this has been my identity. This has been who I am. What now? So almost that fear of failure or that fear of being like, oh, you, you failed or, or you didn't achieve what you set out to achieve. That was kind of the underlying thing that, that drove me. And when I was 21, um, I'd, I'd done stints in Europe, I'd come back, I'd, I'd tried it here and there, I was miserable, I was homesick, I was depressed. Um, and that was eight, that eight was years ago. That was eight, nine years, nine years ago. And then I had kind of, I set myself a, a timeline and I said, okay, you know what, last year, go out, see what you can do. It was a very successful year, I enjoyed myself, I think that was the most important thing. I achieved a lot of results and I got an opportunity, I got a foot in the door. And then it was kind of a whole mindset shift. It's like, okay, so now I've got the foot in the door. Now I can't just, I, my goal was to be a pro. Now I've got the chance to be a pro. Now what? That, that's when the real hard work started. So in my mind, it was always do what you can to become a pro and then you've made it. But that was only once I became a pro and I had made it, that was when I actually had to be like, wow, okay. What I thought was hard work, what I thought was sacrifice, is nothing compared to what I need to do in order to stay in this career and, and, and actually make something of myself. Um, so I just think that that self-belief was always there and that fear of failure or that fear of like kind of losing my identity was always that kind of small voice in the back of my head that kept me, kept me going. Mm. You mentioned money and obviously you don't need to mention exact numbers, but comparing a professional cyclist, obviously let's not compare South African cyclists to a, a South African rugby player. Obviously we would say rugby, if you stay in South Africa, rugby, you're going to earn a lot more. 100%. But how is cycling you know, internationally 
financially compared to international? Because, I mean, we've seen South African rugby players go overseas and go play for these different clubs around Europe as well. You know, what you've seen in the people you've rubbed shoulders with, how is, you know, the money in cycling compared to other sports? I mean, I think that the top dogs in my sport, you know, so so some of the guys I've raced alongside with as teammates, um, you know, who, who are really at the tip top of the sport, winning the Tour de France, things like that. You know, they're earning upwards of 200 million rand a year, which which is a lot of money. Um, but if you compare that to the Formula One drivers and the top football players, it's not. Mm. So it is all relative. I mean, if you compare it to in a South African mindset, you know, we think of rugby, you think of soccer, you think of cricket. As a professional athlete, a cyclist, if you're at the top tier, you know, you, you are earning probably more than more than them, but you've got to be, you know, in the top 50 in the world. Um, yeah, you, well, you almost have to be outside of the country cycling. 100%. You can't be staying within South Africa. No, the guys locally, I mean, the guys who are like winning the Cape Epic and the guys who are winning the Argus and, and the 947, things like that, who are staying locally, they, they're not earning a lot. Um, they're all reliant on kind of local sponsors, a bit of prize money, um, but it, it really isn't a lot. Um, these guys, most of them would have to have kind of part-time jobs on the side or they can do it until their late 20s and then they've got to be like, okay, what's next? Yeah. Fortunately, in professional European cycling or in international cycling, you do get paid better. Um, there is a big, you know, difference between the guys at the top and the guys who are, who are not quite at the top. Um, but but we are looked after quite well. And and I, I mean, I'd like to think, I mean, what I know from what kind of your your rugby players are earning, aside from endorsements, it's, it's pretty similar. Mm. Um, but again, that's only in Europe. The, yeah. the local guys, nowhere close. Yeah, okay. And I think because, I mean, most, if you especially like South African sports, I would say cricket and rugby and maybe soccer, even some soccer players are really underpaid 100%. for a professional sportsman who does this full time. Some you can't, I mean, look at hockey. Professional hockey players in South Africa, almost the entire team has a job. Exactly. And I think, <laughs> uh, even I saw an interview where you uh, mentioned, of, I think it was after um, Rod Joburg, where you said, you know, South Africa's pool is very limited because, uh, how many, I think you mentioned there was like two or three of you that went to Tour de France. There was two of us at Tour de France, but there's only three of us who are kind of like European pros. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's nothing. You know, you're going against a country like Belgium or a country like Denmark, you know, a tiny nation, and they've got 40 riders that are Would professional. Would you say that's more just local funding that's supporting the improvement or? It's a combination of factors. I think when you're in mainland Europe, it's actually quite easy. You know, you can travel to to the Netherlands or you can travel to France and it's an hour, hour and a half. We're here, you know, we're racing in Southern Africa. There aren't races happening within a five hour flight from us, you know, bigger races. So we don't have that exposure. It's the same thing we just spoke about, where if you're racing with guys who are your same level, why do you need to bet yourself? You, you know, you, you kind of you aren't challenged. So the local guys, you know, the, pool, the pool's getting smaller and smaller. It's not the, the level of competition is getting lower and lower. Sponsors are losing interest because they say, why are we going to sponsor this team? We, they're never going to make it to the Tour de France. We'll get more exposure sponsoring a once-off event. Um, so I get it from a business point of view, from return on investment. But I just think it's the, the lack of racing, the less, lack of exposure and... I'm scared to say that I feel like the road cycling in particular in South Africa, the level is going to continue to to deteriorate. Mm. I think, you know, I mean, if I look at Joburg, where can you go? You can go to the cradle to cycle if you want a relatively safe space to ride. I mean, where else do you ride? I mean, I, just this morning I was speaking to a girl who said that she was driving to work and she, well, home from gym or wherever, and she saw the cyclist who had fallen. She said his face was so completely, like, it was, she said like, she almost felt sick seeing it. And obviously, I mean, that kind of riding can happen on safe roads. But I think when you are training and going in between Santon and Bryanston, there's not designated routes. And that's just going to, as you mentioned, the, the pool of cyclists is going to get smaller and smaller because you can't just hop on your bike and go for a three-hour ride. One hour, you're already out of Joburg. There's, how can you really train? That is that's the biggest thing. I mean, I, I train in the cradle every single day. So, I mean, six times a week, I'm out there in the cradle. But to get there, I'm from Bryanston, you know, I've got to go Vitcorp and Cedar, past Broadacres. You've done 25 Ks before you even got there. You know, you've had to deal with a thousand taxis and 15 traffic lights and things like that. Dodging, you know, people just not obeying the rules of the road. Cyclists also have a bad reputation, to be dead honest, you know, riding in the, in the middle of the way. And when I'm in a car, I hate cyclists. But when I live in Spain, in Girona, I can leave my house and within five minutes I'm out of the town and I can go any direction. I can do a five hour loop if I go north, south, whatever, go to the coast, go into the mountains, you have options. We're here, you're so limited. And again, you know, I've been in South Africa now for a month and a half. 
And I know everywhere, every stone is in that cradle of humankind. So we are very limited. And again, that, it makes life hard. Climbing as well. You know, if you try and do mountains here, you can maybe go to the Drakensberg, you can maybe go to Mpumalanga around there, but that's it. If you're in Joburg, your biggest climb is Heckport Hill or Krugerstorp Hill or Stackfontein, and that's a 10 minute effort. Mm. So, you know, where our surroundings don't make it easier for us. Um, you can still make it if you, if you, if, if you're good enough and if you want Exhibit it bad enough, a. <laughs> but it, we are hindered and it is, mm. doesn't make it that easy for, for us and for the local, you, you know, the, the riders. So I do feel for them, um, but it is still possible. Yeah. You've shown it. So you obviously has, cause I remember when we did that riding, it was mountain biking. Was there ever a point where, you know, you were doing a lot of mountain and road and you're like, actually I'm better on the road. So or, you know, how much mountain had you done? I was always mountain. I said I was never going to be a roadie because that's boring and that's lame. And look at these guys and they, they're they pretentious and arrogant and I didn't want to do that. Um, kind of my first year out of school, I did both because I took a gap year, so I had a lot of time. So wherever there was an event, I tried to do it. And I actually found out that I wasn't too bad on the road. Um, and then kind of as I started climbing the ranks, I realized that there was definitely more money in road. You know, with mountain biking, the guys who are winning the Cape Epic you know, they're not flush. The guys who are world championship, you know, you've got to almost be a world champ to, to be okay. There's probably 10 guys in the world who are making good money from mountain biking, maybe, maybe 20, you know, we're in the road, there's hundreds. So I just saw that the chances of making a career out of it was, there was a lot more opportunity in road. And that was kind of when I made that decision mm -hmm. and that, and that shift. Are you, because obviously I wouldn't say mountain is more dangerous, but the potential potentiality when you're on uneven terrain to fall, is maybe higher. How is it as a professional road cyclist who has to stick to a contract and all of that? Are you allowed to do any mountain biking? You have to, like in our contract, it's so, you know, locked tight about you can't do anything that's going to risk injury. So indoor soccer, you know, bungee jumping, go-karting, things like this are a no-no. You can get permission. Mountain biking, they're generally like, okay, it's off season, you know, you're not racing for a few months. You can, but they rather you don't because, yeah, as you say, the risks are higher. Um, I think the big, the crazy injuries happen more on the road because it's at high speed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you crash on a mountain bike, you can be going at 10 k's an hour and you can break a collarbone. And the likelihood of it happening or washing out and, you know, cutting your leg is a lot higher on, on the mountain bike. Um, the road generally, if it's not from traffic, you know, the, the big crashes only happen in the races. So they definitely feel it's more safe. Yeah. And I, I think that's also because you mentioned the mountain biking and the road cycling road being boring. I also had that idea of road cycling being a bit more boring. Then when you start riding on road and you get in these bunches and you're in these groups and you're weaving and you, you know, obviously you're going at higher speeds, it becomes a lot more fun. I mean, I don't have a road bike, but after Ride Joburg, I was like, how can I not have a road bike? This is actually so cool. It, the adrenaline I get, I mean, I come from mountain biking, you do a single track downhill and you feel like on top of the world. It's such a cool feeling. But go down Santon Drive in a group of 40 guys going at 100 k's an hour, the thrill is way, way better. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's what I live for. And how, and also, well, also with comparing this, like the mountain biking to the road, when you are on the road, you're obviously constantly turning. In mountain biking, obviously, there's certain technical parts where you need to concentrate. You're standing up. You're not pedaling at all. But with road cycling, you're in that flow state a lot more. And I think it's so just the revolutions are just going and going and going. It's you be you zone in so nicely, and I think that's also a nice difference. Is it's almost like you're not thinking. You in just a state of like experience and you're just experiencing the revolutions and everything. That's so true. It's, it's almost therapeutic in a yeah. way. Mountain biking, as you mentioned, you know, you, you're pedaling hard up a climb, but then you, you freewheel and you kind of, you're on off, you know, you, you're either like going hard or you're kind of recovering. Where in the road, you know, you, you're always on. So especially if you're doing longer rides, I think it's a lot more taxing on the road because you just, it's a constant grind, but it is that you say that, that the word flow, it's exactly that. It's a kind of state of you just you're in it and you're going and it's yeah very therapeutic and yeah. yeah it's quite special and your wife does she ride no she does not ride i don't think she will ever ride a bike and i'm, I'm not too unhappy about that <laughs> <laughs> it is dangerous but and actually speaking of danger you recent was this towards the end of the year in september i think it was or august august you had a fall yeah i did i mean i was this year has been a very up and down year for me it was a, a new team i started the year with winning national champs so i thought sick this is gonna be a great year I uh, got sick, got pneumonia, was off the bike for a month, kind of came back and I worked really, really hard, got to do the Tour de France, got to do Olympics. 
And the week after Olympics, I was in tour of Poland. Um, stupid little crash. Don't even know what happened. Hit my head quite hard. Lost a bit of consciousness. I suffered with a concussion for a while. But yeah, shoulder, ribs, uh, wrist, lung contusion, and that kind of ended my season. So anything can happen. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things. You've got to pick yourself up and happens to everyone. You know, sometimes it's metaphor a metaphorical crash, but you pick yourself off, you you recover, and then you, you go again. So that ended your season, but you still obviously recently did um, ride Joburg. Was mm. that your first, I wouldn't say you would consider ride Joburg as a race, <laughs> but was that your first? Go back at being properly on the bike in I, that kind of situation? 100%. So I started riding the bike again properly kind of middle of October. Um, a month later was Ride Joburg. So it was the first time I was pinning on my numbers in three months. It was literally three months to the day from my, from my crash. Um, and your know, first time kind of being in that environment again. So yeah, quite, quite nice to come back with a, with a little victory, um, regardless of how big or small it was. But, but yeah, kind of now... Now I'm getting into back into training and then my real season starts um, beginning of February next year. Okay. And that, that fall in Poland, was that your worst you've had as a professional? Um, I broke both collarbones in one go at one time. I've had a lot of road rash. Uh, I had to have a back surgery since I've seen you from a crash. A lot of concussions, but this was kind of the worst because it was when I initially crashed, you know, they were worried about my head because I was unconscious and I didn't know where I was and I had headaches for, for weeks. And then kind of... While I was in hospital, they obviously scanned my shoulder and they knew that there were issues there. And then kind of four weeks later, when my concussion symptoms had kind of subdued, I was still feeling a lot of pain elsewhere. And then I went for more scans and, oh, you've got a broken wrist and, oh, you've got broken ribs. So life just was just painful in general. Um, I think I didn't think about it in the moment, but if I was to kind of put all those injuries together, yeah, it was probably the, the worst crash I've had. Crazy. <laughs> so you mentioned, obviously, starting with your new team this year and obviously as someone who doesn't know how professional cycling works and not having inside information, how does it work in terms of, like let's say with soccer where an uh, athlete will get loaned out to another club, does that similar thing happen within um, cycling or was it like do you have a manager that then found you a better team or a better opportunity within a different team or how does it kind of work with cycling? So in cycling teams, you know, you have contracts and it kind of it works from a, from a calendar date, so 1st of January to 31st of December. And if you sign for a team, you know, you might sign a one-year deal, a three-year deal, whatever it may be, and you ride for that team for that year. So for those 12 months, you have to ride in those colors. No matter what you do, training, racing, you represent that team. And yeah, there's no things like loaning you out. And then I've got an agent, a manager, and he'll kind of middle of the year go to another team or go to your existing team and renegotiate contracts and things like that. And often, it, you know, it's not just about the money. It's about finding a, a space that, that suits you, you know, finding a a team that's more focused on mountains or focused on sprinting or focused on on things like that um and it's also about happiness you know my previous team was the best team in the world they won the Tour de France and it was an amazing team and I had a lot of friends there but my role within the team was was horrible and I just wasn't I wasn't finding joy in it um you know the paycheck was cool but like I was just hating life and you were getting pulled from pillar to post you have a plan of okay I'm going to do these races so I'm racing doing a, a five-day race in March, I'm doing a two-week race in April, I'm doing a couple of one-day races, but it would constantly change. And, you know, like me and my wife planned a holiday and I'm at the airport about to like fly home after a race and the team calls me and says, oh, Ryan, sorry, you're going to fly to Spain. <sighs> okay, so I'm doing that one week, that week, week race in Spain and then the day before the final stage, like after this, you're actually flying to Belgium for another week. And then <sighs> just, and that's hard, you know, it's part of your job and you signed up for it, but that was tough and that's the main reason I did change. Mm. And obviously you've got your home base in Spain, right? Yes. How does it, you know, because obviously your previous team was UAE. How do you, obviously you got your home base. How much of that is traveling? How much of it is the team training together? So you go to a few training camps a year. So there'll be like five training camps a year where the whole squad's together. Other than that, you only see the guys at, at races. So, you know, you have to be European based because 95% of the races on Europe and you know, what's, the, what's nice about being in mainland Europe is, as I mentioned earlier, you're an hour and a half flight from anywhere. So I live close to Barcelona airport. It flies anywhere. You can be in Paris in an hour and a half. You can be in Amsterdam in two hours. Um, but where I am in Spain in my home base, that's kind of in between races. So I don't spend that much time there, to be dead honest with you. It's often kind of like a, a stopgap. You're there for a few days at a time, sometimes two weeks at a time. But you're very seldom there for, for in season more than more than two weeks without going to a training camp or going to a race. Um, I don't have any teammates who live in the same town as me, but there are a lot of other cyclists who live there. Um, a lot of the Americans, Australians, you know, the English speaking expats and you've got mates that you can train with, but 
generally, yeah, you don't train with your teammates. You, you train alone. And how long is the main portion of the season? It starts 1st of February um, and it goes, well, there are some, there's races in Australia in, in mid-Jan, but typically the European season 1st of February to middle of October. And you, I mean, obviously you've cycled almost everywhere in Europe. Most of the places in the world you mentioned are Australia. Or have you cycled there before? Yeah, yeah. You have, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So for you, what's your most deepest? This is a lot. Let me just quickly turn this on silent. <laughs> for you, what is your most like the place that you enjoy the most? Again, this obviously, is, it's also race dependent, vibe dependent. Hundred percent, hundred percent. If if it, my knee jerk reaction would be Malaysia, believe it or not, just because it's like an interesting culture. The weather was good. Um, I also won won the race overall, so. That was obviously I've got good memories for that. Mm. Um, I typically, being a Southern Hemisphere boy, boy, I love racing when it's hot. So the Middle East races, racing in in the UAE, Oman, Qatar, Australia, um, that's really good for me. But one place which was quite special was Canada. We raced in in Quebec, um, so Quebec City and Montreal, and that was fantastic. I think that was probably a place I, I won't ever forget racing a bike. And you know, people watch Tour de France; they can see how hot it is there. It's you know summer. Have you, and I've seen some videos, obviously you're riding in f long clothes and obviously we know Europe gets very cold at times, but have you ever had times where it's just completely unbearable and obviously you have to train? It's, it's this year I, I've suffered quite a bit with, with the cold. I mean, you're doing training camps in, in Europe in January, you know, that's kind of middle of their winter and the average temperature of the day is five degrees and it starts raining and you're hating life and you've got to go out and do it. And a lot of... What I really struggle with, you know, if you ride in South Africa, you ride on the road in Joburg, what you were talking about now is how you, cons you, you the whole time you're consistently pedaling. If I go do a mountain pass, you know, if you go down a mountain pass in the rain, you can't really pedal, you can't really go fast. So you often go through periods of like 20 minutes where all you're doing is turning and braking and you get so cold, you know, you're going from 1,500 meters to sea level, it's like a 10 degree temperature drop. Um, it's, it's, that's tough. I've done races as well where it starts snowing and all you think to yourself is like, what am I doing here? And it's, it's miserable. It is miserable, especially being like liking the summer and being from South Africa, but you just got to tolerate it and endure, you know? But I think those are just the sacrifices <laughs> that are part of the job. Another, another sacrifice. Yeah. And how was your experience of being at the Olympics? It was good. I mean, my, my first Olympics experience in Japan was, was a little bit tainted being COVID. Um, the cyclists are cycling route was quite far outside of of tokyo itself so we never got to the go to the athlete village we were quite separated um so it was nice to kind of have a real you know olympic experience being in the athlete village and, and experiencing that and rubbing shoulders with you know some of the biggest names in the world personally i didn't have the, the best race um i went in with a lot of ambition i just came off the tour de france i think i trained too hard in between because it was only about 10 days in between and i should have maybe i've just done a three-week grand tour do a Tour de France, maybe have a few days of recovery, but I was too excited and very yeah, inexperienced. I, I pushed too hard. So the Olympic, the, the road race, yeah, I didn't achieve what I wanted to there. Um, so that was a bit sour, but the whole experience was was unreal. And my wife got to fly there and, you know, we spent some time after the race and just being around that that vibe and, mm -hmm. you know, going to like the volleyball and the, the skate park and things like that was, was so special. And, you know, to see, I've been to Paris so many times, but to see like the Paris CBD literally shut down for an event is is unreal and awesome. yeah something i won't forget and as a south african how much of you know south africa in terms of like government praise or like as going to representing your country is there much <laughs> that you get from being a south african representing south africa i think it's hard i think it depends on on the sport you know yeah. i think you know being a cyclist is is it's not really a, a big sport also not being a, a medal contender unfortunately there was not that much awareness around it. Um, I didn't fly from South Africa, so I wasn't part of that vibe where people got their Olympic suitcase and they climbed on the plane together and they landed together. So I didn't have any of that. But I, yeah, I, believe it or not, had to pay my own way there, which is unheard of. You know, Sascock should be covering the ball of that and I'm, yeah. I'm still going to get refunded, hopefully. Doubt it. <laughs> but, but yeah, there was no recognition, n not, yeah, n not at all, unfortunately. Again, so, yeah. So then who, how do you get it, uh, contacted? Who contacts you? Does... 
the Olympic board or whatever, is it South African people that then contact you say, we, you know, you've been selected or how does the selection process even work for? So the South African Olympic committee called SASCOC, they'll go to every single federation of every sport. So they'll go to cycling South Africa, which is the federation of cycling. They'll go to hockey South Africa, athletic South Africa. And then that uh, federation contacts you and they say, listen, you know, you're on the list or you're going to go. Um, and then kind of all the correspondence happens through them. What people don't realize is when you go to the Olympics, there's so much admin there's so much paperwork you've got to do criminal checks you've got to do like sexual offenders checks you've got to do and i think it's 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 valuable and it's really important a lot of like anti-doping information for for those because a lot of people who go to olympics aren't necessarily professional athletes mm -hmm. you know they go there for shooting or they go there especially as a south african representative yeah. exactly so so there's a lot of admin a lot of paperwork a lot of stress uh, for a lot of people also like that's their pinnacle you know like they go to the olympics and that's what they've been working for for four years and that's it where i went to the olympics and two days later i was flying to poland for another race so it, it got a little bit overwhelming and you know it's like, is it worth all the stress like part of me was even thinking like i'm not going to do the next olympics just because it's not worth the, the stress mm. um but you know i'm saying that but in all honesty yeah, it is it's it's surreal and it's something yeah i think any athlete strives for and it's an experience that you won't ever forget so what is your pinnacle then what has been so far Again, sounds cliche, but Tour de France, it's 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 the biggest race in the world. If you talk of cycling, you know, yeah. if you don't know the Tour if de France. If you don't know cycling, you will know at least of know, the Tour de France. You'll know the Tour de France. Yeah. And, you know, you, you watch it on TV and, and, and you see the beauty and you see the crowds and the people shouting when you're going up a mountain. But when you're in that and you're going up a 20 kilometer mountain and from the bottom to the top, there are spectators all the way packed five deep. You know, there's millions. You go watch a football match, you know, maybe the stands can hold 70,000 people. You've got a million people on one road. You know, it's 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 such a vibe. It's such a thrill. You, you, you get treated like a god. You know, you've got getting weighted on hand and foot. You're getting massaged. You're getting cooked for. You're just having to sign stuff. It's It almost, you know, you boost your ego a little bit, but it's something that's, yeah, unless you, you've, you've seen it and you've been there physically to understand the magnitude of it. I think it's what, the second or third biggest sporting event in the world. Tour de France is, was, was where it's at. Amazing. And because you've obviously done many great things and have reached almost the pinnacle of cycling in terms of doing the best events at each, you know, the, like the Olympics and all of those and the Tour de France, how much of... It have you had to learn like okay well now that i've done that like as you mentioned you know you've been to the olympics it's kind of like yeah i went to the olympics so how much of your career have you had to learn like this is a three hour ride in the cradle i need to be able to enjoy this as much as going to the olympics because the moment the olympic is done it's like oh okay you always i think have to set goals i think you always have to have purpose you always have to make the most of it and yes you know training for the Olympics or the Tour de France, you're doing seven hour rides at altitude camps versus now this time of year where I'm going to do a three, four hour ride in the cradle, but I'm doing this for a purpose. I'm doing this to build up a foundation. I'm doing this to build up stamina, endurance base. So everything you've got, you, I'm doing is for a purpose. And the only reason I can have is if, if you set goals, whether that be a specific event like the Olympics, whether it be to win something, or whether it be for a paycheck, I think you always, what, what's always driven me is I've always have to work towards something. Cause if you're just doing something for, for the sake of it, it's like going to a nine to five that you hate. Mm. It's just, you're part of the machine. You, you're not inspired. You're not motivated. You're not giving your best, but you're going to go nowhere. You always have to like, why am I doing this? And, and let something drive you. Yeah. And what I've really had to learn is, you know, when you achieve what you've been working towards and what you've set your goal on, and put your eyes and your, all your focus on, once you get it, the novelty quickly wears off. And, you know, it means, doesn't mean, but so as someone who likes to achieve, you know, you want to do good things. So once you do something, oh, I've been to the Olympics, okay. Oh, I've been to Tour de France, okay. Because like, I can do better, I can mm. do more. But how have you navigated that of, you know, I need to be able to be happy with myself, with my achievements now, they're not thinking, okay, the happiness can be found if one day I win a, a stage at the Tour de France. You know, how have you kind of managed that? That is a good question. I think as I got older, I've kind of realized it's more about the process. Um, for example, when I won my first South African championships, you know, that was the goal. I kind of worked towards that for months and months and months. I won it. I was so happy. We had a jaw that night. And Monday morning, I was like depressed. I was like, okay, what now? I've now got to go and ride again. And, you know, I just, I hated it. 
where what I've learned and, and it's from listening to podcasts, reading books. I mean, one actually that I got from from you from you were, the book that you mentioned once was the stillness is the key mm. and a lot of Ryan Holiday's things. And it's about the process and it's not about the end goal. It's not about the, the race. It's about the, the mundane things that no one sees. It's about the doing the, the good, clean eating, the gym work, the, the training, the stuff that no one sees. Let that bring you joy and fulfillment because you know, there'll always be another race. There'll always be, you can win and then you won't win. You know, no one's a champion forever. You're going to have so many highs and lows. The only thing you can control is what you put in and mm. let that process kind of drive you and, and give you that sense of fulfillment. And once you've got that, you know, yes, you know, you are going to be more motivated some days and you are going to be happy after a win and demotivated after a loss. But the process is, and, you know, just continue in that process and, and let that kind of drive you. Yeah. And I think it's also just, you know, okay, I've won this race this five years ago was a dream of mine and it's just punctuating those pursuits of realizing like okay what i have right now might at this time maybe seem like not enough or i want to achieve more but this was one something i was really hoping to achieve and maybe i didn't even think i could but now i'm at this point just reflect back and be like yo look how far i've come and i think as someone that always wants to do well it's challenging because you don't want to allow yourself almost to be like actually i've done pretty well because then in my in my case at least it's you think okay well am i going to take the foot off the pedal then if i allow myself to be proud i hear you i think you've got to you don't want to rest in your laurels you don't want to get complacent you almost want to you, you set goals and you want to shift the goalpost so like you, you you achieve this goal but then you, your next goal should be a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger but whilst you're pursuing that next goal or that bigger goal you need to have that self-reflection. And, and as you say, you know, it might not mean anything to you now, but five years, that was all you wanted. Whether it was you wanted to sign a, a contract to earn that much money. And once you've got that, you're like, okay, cool. Now, five years down the road, you're like, that's nothing. But that was at one point a goal. And you did achieve that. And maybe, yeah, not be proud, but but recognize what you've done and self-reflect and and acknowledge your growth. And I think that also motivates you and stimulate for, for continued growth. Mm -hmm. Have you felt proud in your career? I think I have. I think I, I think as a as a performance athlete, there's a lot of you have to be arrogant at certain times. Um, some people more than others. I have had moments where I'm proud, but I've fallen so quickly thereafter that you know I was humbled very quickly. So I think I'm I'm almost scared of being proud now. I'd rather be be content and be happy and be and be you, you know I don't know. But but proud is is a very dangerous thing. Mm. Um, I think I think it's. Proud, proud, yeah. proud in the positive sense of I put in the work and I, you know, I performed well. Not I put in the work, I'm the best here. Yes. Yes. I think there's a fine line between like pride and arrogance. Yes. Okay. Whereas you can be proud because you have achieved what 99% of cyclists will never achieve. That doesn't mean that you think you're the best because you're proud of maybe uh, I was doing 10k races in Ramburg when I was 12 look where I am now doesn't mean because of that you're going to stop trying to mm, do more mm, mm, that's a good point yeah. I, th I think because I, I, being proud you can still be humble while being proud you know maybe you don't have to tell the world I'm proud but you can just be like bro I just did the Tour de France yeah. like that's pretty cool that's pretty epic I think you're right. I think, yeah, I think it, it's difference to arrogance and it's also, it doesn't mean you have to then now stop or you have yeah. to look down on people or down on your old self. I think, yeah, it's, that's very interesting. So for you and what is, because obviously you've achieved milestones within your career, but what is a milestone that you've always thought of, or at least maybe as your career has progressed has then become a milestone that you are still yet to do? Very good question. Um, I think it is a stage of, of the Tour de France. To win a stage of the Tour de France, I think that's any cyclist's dream. And I think I've got to still be hungry and ambitious. To be 100% honest, um, I'm getting older and my role within the team is, has shifted slightly. So I've almost had to put that kind of that goal or, or that idea on the back burner for a little bit. But if, if anyone was to ask me kind of what haven't I achieved that I want to, it would be to win a stage of the Tour de France. And how challenging is that then? Because obviously, as you say, your role has shifted. You know, you can't just <laughs> go and try to win exactly. and leave your team, but you've got roles and you've got responsibilities. So was that also obviously your, your team shift 
to maybe allow you to maybe go that route a bit better? 100%. I think, you know, when the team I rode for previously, because of the kind of rider I was, I was never even going to get to the to do the Tour de France with them. You know, I'd had done it prior to being with them. They were always about winning the yellow jersey at the Tour de France, always climbing in the mountains. So their whole team is a bunch of 60 kilogram men. You know, that's just not me. So, you know, I had to step back um, or, or not step to, to the side. Mm. Where I am now definitely opens up the opportunity. And, and even this year, you know, I had my team captain, he crashed out and they gave me an opportunity. Um, I came six in the day, so it's not, wasn't a stage one, wasn't, wasn't what I wanted, but I had an opportunity to sprint to the Tour de France, which is something I hadn't had in the past. Um, but again, I think I would be upset if I ended my career without a, without a nice stage victory. Mm. And you mentioned you're getting older. What is the age timeline within professional cycling? It's changing so much. I mean, when I turned professional, I was 21. The average age of the peloton was 31 and guys were riding until they were 40. Now I'm 30 and I'm one of the old guys. You know, guys are retiring at 30, 31. There's not many guys who are older than 35 and the average age is 27. So we've got... You think that's just popularity? So there's more young riders? There's more awareness about it. There's more access to information as well. So, you know, back in the day, 10 years ago, guys, you know, if you, if you want to be a good cyclist, you go, you train, you do seven hours every day. That's what makes you good. When now you realize, okay, do it scientifically. You know, there's got to be quality over quantity. There's power meters, there's nutrition. You know, um, my first grand tour, we were doing 50 grams of carbs per hour. Now we're doing 150, you know, it's, it's changed so much. And, you know, with technology and, and, and the access to information, kids at 18 are doing it and they're getting so good. And, you know, bikes are getting faster, everything's just improving. And it's also getting more and more dangerous. You know, a lot of crashes and races where if you crash in your 20, you know, you get up and forget about it. When you crash when you're 35 with kids, you're like, shucks, you know, it's taken me two months to recover. That wasn't so lucky. Maybe I should rethink this. And also the teams are probably getting more cutthroat in the sense that... 100%. There's a 21 year old that's going to replace you. You're taking too long to recover. Bye. That's exactly it. You know, this guy, he's back on his bike a day later. You've taken two, two, three weeks off the bike. Another thing is, is now you're riding with race radios and you, you get, you know, information and there's like a corner, for example, and every single rider is getting the exact same information put into the ear. You need to be around that corner first. So there's 200 riders in that peloton. Every single one is being told you need to be around that corner first. Only one guy can go around that corner first. And it doesn't come, often it comes down to ability, but more often than not, it comes to, to balls. And a 21 year old, he's going to risk his life to go around the corner first. You get a bit older, you're like, shucks, I know what it feels like to crash. And this is getting a bit dangerous. And you start breaking, hesitating. And the second you start doing that, you know, the end is in sight. Mm. 150 grams per hour. How are you consuming that? Is it mainly liquids? Mainly liquids. Um, it, you got to train this, the stomach. You know, it's generally the rule of thumb was, you know, one gram of carb per kilogram of body weight. So if you weigh 80 kilograms, you can do 80 grams of carbs per hour. That's what your body can, you know, absorb without you training the gut. You've got to train the gut. So it's a lot of like you do these rides and you're just basically shoving down gels and shoving down high carb mix. But, you know, also when I started, you'd eat a banana, eat a panini, eat an energy bar. Nowadays, it's just gels, gels and, and the drink. Mm. which is just yeah, and it's a, a bit easier to for the gut and also more energy can be used for the muscles as opposed to trying to digest digest and also you know you try you're going up a hill and you can't even breathe and now you're trying to chew on something and guys yeah. are attacking you but you just have a, a gel or a, or a swig of, of a liquid it's it's easier to to get in and within your team does little trick have a supplement partner where all of you are using the same brand yeah so we're sponsored by innovate which is an italian brand and you know because we are sponsored by them you know they've got everything that's available to the, the public you know and the general consumer but for certain riders who maybe are a little bit more sensitive to fructose or you know they can't do certain things they, they tailor make things for you but yeah we all sponsored and you get as much as you want mm. and any flavor you want and and bike wise how does how does obviously maybe you don't have to tell us your secret contract that you've got there but you know how does that work like okay guys i'm in joburg i don't feel like taking my bike okay ryan go to trek south africa go grab a bike you would think it should be like that. And in, in Europe, it's like that. So there's a Trek store in Girona where I live. And if I go in there, I need a mountain bike, a gravel bike, a road bike, I got it. I haven't had the support from these guys just yet. Um, maybe it's also my own fault. But but generally, it's like that. You you do get supported. You have to be on a Trek. It's in your contract. You've got to ride a Trek. Um, there's a bit of like miscommunication of do you get to keep the bike? Do you have to give a bike back? Things like that. Um, generally, everyone gets two bikes that stay at home with them. Um, cause when you go to a race, you don't take your bike with you. You know, you, you've got seven bikes that are set up for you that go with the trucks and things like that. So you have a bike that will stay in South Africa. I think that's something people might not realize oh, is really? that, yeah, I, I, well, maybe I just don't know, but I would say 
obviously, you know, as a professional athlete, then those seven bikes that are whatever set up for you, they've done the measurements, they know your exact They're everything. identical. You wouldn't be able to tell if you ch- jumped from the one to the other. So for example, you do a race and you're on your bike, so that's your, your race bike one, and then you've got two cars that are following you. So the, the car behind you has got a spare bike for you and it's identical, and the car behind that's also got one. So if you crash or if you break a wheel and you know it's, it's going to take too long to just change the wheel, you jump on a new bike. Um, let's say, I mean, I've been in an instance where I broke three bikes in one day. I was involved in three crashes, three bikes broken, you know, then what do you do? Then in the truck for the next day, they've got to have bikes ready for you. And, and I mean, the amount of money and the equipment and the resources, it's stupid. Cause it's not just you, it's the rest of the team that also needs three or four bikes waiting for them. There's eight riders who do the Tour de France. And you know, there's some days that are time trials. So it's a different, it's a unique bike. So there's eight riders. I would say there's a there's easily 70 bikes for those eight riders, and you've got probably 60 staff as well. And this is from doctors, chefs, people, mechanics, bus drivers. So and that's a lot. all within little tricks. That's team. just little tricks. So every team you see out there has got the same. So I mean the the, the infrastructure and and what goes into it is it's it's stupid. Yeah, I think people just as the consumer of it. You just sit there and you just see, you obviously you see the support vehicles and you see maybe a spare bike on the car or whatever, but you don't actually understand how much is actually then going into it. And then you can see why there's so much money within cycling and Mm. there is a massive amount of money within cycling because, I mean, look how much support those individual riders have. I mean, if you think about what a bike costs these days, I mean, the prices are getting stupid, but I actually just came from a bike shop now. My bike stock standard, I mean, mine's probably even a little bit better with a few upgrades here and there, is going to cost you 350,000 Rand at a bike shop. And I've got seven of those in one race, you know, and that's, that's just the bike. And then you can break a wheel or after every five days, you need a new chain, you, you know, your, your Garmin, or we use Wahoo, which is, which is a lot better than Garmin. <laughs> and it's like that. It's just so much that goes into it. Even just nutrition. I mean, I went to buy nutrition for the first time in 10 years before the ride Joburg. And just one sachet of mix was 50 Rand. Mm. And, you know, I'll go through two sachets per hour yeah. for six hours, day after day after day. And, you know, if you, that's just on, on juice. So if you think about the money, it's, it's stupid. But I think that's why as a professional in any field within sport, that's what this then does help you separate a lot more is your nutrition 100% is going to be on point. Your recovery, because straight off to a stage, you've got a massage, you've got this, you've got that, you've got ice pods, you've got whatever you need. Whereas someone doing Cape Epic as a privateer or whatever then is massaging themselves. They are then having to fix their, okay, well obviously maybe a Cape Epic that have mechanics and stuff, but They're a large portion a of it is just you yeah. doing it yourself. And that's, I think what people miss it don't realize that you've, you do as a professional athlete have a lot of help Obviously, you still need to be amazing. You still need to put in the work. But there is a lot of outside help and community that make the athlete the athlete. It is. You can't compare it. You know, it is. We are we are spoiled and we are treated like princesses. Um, but again, I think in order to perform at that level, you need it. Mm. But what you're also saying now, what people, the reason why people don't realize it, you know, people, anyone can go and enter the 947. Anyone can go and do a mountain bike stage race. So they feel that they can relate to being a professional cyclist because, you know, you've done it. How many people have suffered out there? You know, you're riding up a climb and you're cramping. So yes, you do understand to a degree what I do. But a lot of people kind of confuse that with, okay, so you not understand what it's like to be a pro cyclist, where people don't go and play rugby on, on a weekend. So they're not going to try and imagine or relate to what a rugby player is feeling. Um, and that's where I feel like a lot of it's it's nice in a way that people can cycle and people can go and do five, six hours on the weekends if, if they were even two hours or whatever it may be and suffer and cramp and, you know, blo- uh, bonk on a climb. So they can kind of understand it, but it is it is very different. And unless you've been in there and, and seen it and touched it, it's it's you can't relate. Actually. Yeah, because those people that you're talking about, they kind of will do a one hour ride maybe Monday to Friday and on Saturday, maybe a three or four hour ride. Whereas you're doing like six, seven, eight, every single day of the week, pretty exactly. much. Exactly. And you are, regardless of the weather, okay, well, Ryan, you have to be out there to train. Okay. You know, your daughter's just been born. Well, Ryan, you still need to go and train. So I think that uh, we mentioned that earlier, but that's the big difference yeah. where it's, oh no, it's raining. Maybe I just go sit on the trainer for two hours where it's like, okay, well, Ryan, go sit on the trainer for eight hours then if you can't get outside. It's not a choice anymore. And I've done that. I've, I've, I did three days back to back in 2022 of six hour rides in the tra- on the trainer, 
miserable, but I didn't have a choice. Mm. And you know, it, it could have easy. I could have easily been like, oh, after two hours, this is horrible. But then I'd, I'd pay for it in the next race, and I'm accountable because my team, my coach, everyone's like, what are you doing? You know, this you had to do this. Um, and that maybe does is, is the difference. You know, at, at the end of it, it's I have to do this mm. rather than oh, this would be nice to do. So season starts in Feb. Is there a first race? That has already been marked? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, the way that sport's getting so professional and, and everyone wants to ensure that everyone is at their peak at all times. So we've got a big squad. So there's a lot of races that happen kind of simultaneously. Um, so we've got a squad of 28 riders. And, you know, there'll be six riders will go race in Australia. A group of 10 will go race here. So they kind of they plan it based on the, the route suitability, things like that. Um, they obviously have goals for the year. So our team says, you know, their goals for this year is they want to win 50 races. They want to win three stages of the Tour de France. And then they go like, okay, how can we do that? Based on our squad, based on our riders, who are the best candidates for that? And then with doing that, which is the best team we can build around that, that rider. So based on that, you know, months and months before the race, they've already got like the whole year planned out. Um, so my first race is in, in beginning of February. It's a one week race in France. Um, I have two days off and then another one week race in France. Then I'll do a training camp in Mallorca, um, and then another one-week race in France, Paris-Nice, which is quite a big one, and then goes into the classics. So like the spring classics, Milan, San Remo, Paris-Roubaix, things like that, um, and then a bit of a break, and then kind of we'll see what happens in the second half of the year. Amazing. Well, Ryan, bro, you are soon to be a father, and that's incredible, and thank you for sitting down with us. I think I'm very privileged to be able to. And I think the only reason here is because I knew you before you were a professional cyclist. So thank you very much. Uh, not to say that you wouldn't maybe agree to this kind of thing of if I didn't know you, because I know you're still humble <laughs> and you still have, you know, things that you want to achieve. So you don't see yourself as being this incredible athlete. And I think that's why you will continue to achieve is because of your humility and, you know, your willingness to do things for the little guy like me. <laughs> I appreciate that very much. But I can honestly say as well from just like, I've been following you and watching your stuff and I've also learned a lot and you're like, whether it be a, a book recommendation or whatever. So, so thank you. Awesome, man. Thank you. And I'm getting more and more into cycling and I've now cycling is 100% my favorite discipline with the stuff Sick. that I'm doing soon to be maybe then getting more into road. Right. We'll see. I hope I see you in the cradle soon then. Bro. Yeah, definitely. Like. And thanks guys for watching. Cheers.